So you had already very long days, uh, starting with the concept and the principle of polarimetry and also the application of polarimetry yesterday. Uh, so my intent today is to introduce uh, not any more polarimetry, but uh, go forward and uh, assume actually that polarimetry and the basic concept are already now known. So therefore, I will introduce uh, sorry interferometry as one uh, as an important part, and then also the combination between polarimetry and interferometry. Okay. Um, so, yeah, to myself, uh, Amalia, Amalia was already uh, presenting myself quite well. Uh, probably just to say from the background, um, I'm a geoscientist um, as a background. And uh, probably what would be also interesting to see that my PhD I've done in parametric SAR uh, in the estimation of soil moisture, where I have developed a, a new model approach in order to estimate it. And then later on, uh, I was uh, going further on to understand a little bit more cryospheric applications, uh, agriculture applications in general. Uh, that's a little bit uh, my favorite uh, topic that I have in the moment um, where people are working on also. Okay, let us start uh, with subpolarimetry and interferometry again, a little bit of wrap up and, and to see also what are the combination and why is this combination really so important for us or why it has been used this combination uh, for a lot of different applications. So subpolarimetry, and this is what you have heard now, nowadays uh, very a lot in, in the last uh, few days is that the polarimetry allows the identification on and decomposition of different scattering processes occurring within one resolution cell. I think this has been a major effort why polarimetry is so important because you can distinguish really different scattering mechanisms and you can identify them. And then later on, if you like, you can use the scattering mechanism uh, to extract some uh, yeah, information content out of this geophysical information content. This is very well seen on one of the very exposed, I would uh, test site that we have, which is in principle the DLR uh, Oberpfaffenhofen test site here uh, from the German Aerospace Center. Um, you see here, uh, these are the buildings of the Ger uh, German Aerospace Center. This is the runway that we have in front uh, of our buildings. And then we have here the grassland uh, forest areas uh, here seen. There's a small village also close to it, uh, a big motorway also seen and some agricultural uh, areas here. So, and you see already on this colored image, uh, that uh, this can be the colored um, or the colors uh, represent really the different scattering mechanism that we have here. This is a, a very typical representation, representation in the RGB, so red, green, blue colors uh, that you could see here. Uh, then what we have is just to see what is the difference using only one channel. Uh, SAR systems, as for example, one channel could be here as an example, the VV channels, so the vertical polarized channels where we have vertical transmit and uh, vertical received. And you see this one, we can only, we have, we have structural information, that is important, right? But because with structural information, we can already do also some first uh, analysis out of, uh, out of the scene, actually. Uh, but what we cannot do is extraction of different scattering mechanism out of it. So that's really a reduced information content that we have if you use single channel sound. But as you have heard already, what we have also, if we use a single channel uh, SAR, is you could also use single channel SAR and have an acquisition that is twice uh, over, uh, over the same area of interest with a small separation in terms of incidence angle. And like this, you have two acquisition of the same scene with the same, scene with the same geometry. And uh, like this, what you can do, you can do out of the triangulation, you can estimate actually uh, the interferometric height out of it. Um, what, we, what we see and what you have probably heard already, uh, radar is working like this, that you have an active system where the electromagnetic wave is transmitted. And what you can, uh, in terms of a pulse and uh, this pulse, um, the, the time actually of the transmission um, and then also, again, the reception can be measured, and this is in principle measuring our distances. And with the distance measure, uh, which we uh, which we do here in in SAR, uh, in, in inter uh, so in, in in any kind of SAR systems, 
if you have two acquisition of it, as I was saying, you can do twice the measurement and you can estimate the, uh, the height properties actually of the scene. And this is done with this, in, this is called with interferometry and interferometry allows you the location of the different scattering centers uh, inside the resolution cell. So the one is, it allows you, so subpolarometry allows you the identification of the different scattering mechanisms. Uh, but still, if you have the mechanisms, you don't know on which in on which height these mechanisms um, are scattered. So what you need in principle is a, is another information, which is called the height. And the height you can then identify actually with interferometry. So this is a property uh, allowing you to estimate heights, uh, which means in principle effect, the effective scattering center. And the combination then, uh, and this is what, what we are talking about today here, uh, is to estimate or that colorimetric interferometry has a potential uh, to separate in principle in height the different scattering processes uh, that are occurring within one resolution cell. So that's a main basic concept actually uh, having this combination polarimetry where you have the identification of a scattering mechanisms and the combination with interferometry where you can estimate the heights of each of the scattering contribution or scattering mechanism. And like this, you can do a separation principle between the different um, scattering mechanisms that are occurring at different heights within one resolution cell. So that's in principle the main beauty of these, um, of parametric and interferometry. You can imagine um, that's, that's um, important uh, specifically for certain applications. It's not really very important for applications where you have only uh, bar surfaces, right? But what is important here is mainly for volume scatterers. So it is very useful to use this approach, so this combination, uh, when you like to estimate um, volume scatter. Volume scatterer or distributed scatterer has been probably also introduced in a parametric SAR are mainly scatterer like, for example, forest areas, can be also um, ice areas, snow areas, uh, but could be also desert areas where you have penetration into, uh, into very dry surfaces and um, the contribution of the volume is becoming uh, very strong, which is the same actually for snow and ice uh, too. So therefore this uh, combination here provides a very, very um, distinct information content over volume scatterers. Okay, but what we do today um, is before we start with the combined concept polarimetry and, and sound interferometry, interferometry, we will start now, or I will start now in the first uh, one and a half hour to introduce only the one concept, which is interferometry, so that you later on understand also much better this combination. So therefore, I will go now uh, just into interferometry without having this parametric um, uh, diversity and will introduce actually what is our interferometry. So that's our interferometry, and this is something that I was already uh, just mentioning, um, is in principle the estimation of the surface um, uh, or the, the, the surface ground actually uh, using two acquisition of the same scene uh, where we have a small separation by, the, by an incidence angle of the scene in order to get, uh, we call it phase differences, and this phase difference can be then uh, inverted or uh, transformed, let me say like this, uh, into height, um, um, height values. So in principle, what sound deformetry does is uh, sound deformetry refers to the use of phase differences um, measurements between two uh, SAR acquisition could be also more SAR acquisitions um, acquired, uh, separated in space and time uh, to estimate relative distances to an object or scattering. Must not be also separation in time, could be that we have single pass uh, interferometric systems that we have also nowadays in space. Uh, but the normal systems up to now are working in a repeat pass time, which means um, after a while, the satellite is coming back and, and is doing, in principle, a second acquisition. 
So what we get out of the sound interferometry, so the face, so this is one of the face images that you see here. Uh, it's a face difference image um, and uh, the face difference image between two acquisition. Uh, you see what, what you can get out of you after doing some small uh, processing. Uh, you can get uh, these kind of very, very typical images where you see um, uh, patterns. These are frequency patterns uh, that are varying uh, between um, uh, pi um, and two pi's. So this is what we have normally, and um, and this can be color coded as seen here um, in in a color coding uh, situation. And what we do uh, nowadays is we or what we do in order to interpret this. So the the frequency measure actually of these fringes, which we are calling also in this frequency pattern, the interference pattern seen here. Uh, the frequency of this interference pattern is very important in order to say if something is very steep or has a more um, moderate uh, height uh, height observation. So in this case, what you see is not really height, uh, but what we also will uh, go into it uh, is into deformation. So not only that we measure height, but what happens if you, for example, have an earthquake and the and the earth was moving into a uh, towards in principle the sensor or away from the sensor then you would also see kind of um, changes in terms of patterns height difference patterns uh, that you see actually here uh, as an example for sound interferometry so we will go today to uh, learn more about we call it repeat pass sound interferometry um, cross-track interferometry also called and uh, we will he hear something about uh, deformations, which is uh, differential sound interferometry. So these are the, the two main concept uh, that will be introduced now in the following. So let us start with a very, very basic concept of uh, sound interferometry. Um, let us assume that we have a topographic area like seen here. Uh, we have a point uh, that is located on, on a certain height, so height is H0, and we have a certain distance, which is R1 to a sensor here. So then our signal uh, is in principle can be defined as an image one, for example, and the image one is defined as an image of where, where we have two components. We have an amplitude component and the phase component that we see here, which is expressed as exponent E. Uh, e, um, where we have this is expression, the geometric expression of 2 pi uh, divided by lambda uh, multiplied by 2 uh, and by the by the distance r1 uh, between the sensor and the point. And then we have at the end um, another uh, phase term, which is here called uh, s1. So just coming now to this phase term, which is this exponential a contribution here we call this uh, we can also call this as a phase therefore we are calling this phi and this uh, phi estimate is actually nothing else uh, again coming to this geometrical properties this is nothing else than the distance uh, measure that we have here which is our geometrical property uh, the, the lambda is our wavelengths and r1 is in principle um, the distance and two means uh, the distance uh, that the a signal is going forward and backward, so twice. And then we have, as of again saying, an additional contribution, which we call um, the phi s contribution. So the first part here is a deterministic part, uh, which because it is proportional to the range uh, distance. So the range distance means uh, the distance between the sensor and the point um, of interest. And the second part is in, our, is in our case, the stochastic part. So this is the phi S1, which is, which is induced by the scatterer, uh, uh, by the scatterer itself, and means it's, it's a kind of speckle contribution. So if you consider we have a resolution cell, as we see here, with different scatterers within this resolution cell, then in principle, we could consider that our signal uh, can be uh, can be described as a vector, where the vector has a certain length and it has a certain orientation. The orientation is represented as a phase and the vector length is represented as an amplitude of our signal. The same as you see actually here uh, in this equation. So what happens if I have more different scatterers within one resolution cell? It means that I have 
in principle, I can still contain the same length of my um, of my amplitude, uh, my intensity or strength of the signal. Uh, but what happens is because I have different distances of each of the scatterer to my uh, to my sensor. Uh, what happens actually that uh, the phase uh, is in principle, the phase is varying uh, within one space, uh, within one resolution cell. And therefore what happens here is that we get something we're calling this in radar terms, um, random walk, uh, where the phase contribution is in principle uh, at the end, a summation of all these different uh, phases that we have. And this is producing our speckle effects where the adjacent pixels uh, can have uh, differences in terms of phases. And therefore we have these kind of effects where you have black and white pixels, salt and pepper effect, as I was saying, uh, close to each other, even though uh, the region of interest is, um, is represented as an homogeneous distributed scattering region. So that's our speckle effect and this is uh, contributing uh, by the phi S1 term, uh, as I was saying, which is our stochastic parameter. So if I have now uh, the image, uh, which is uh, the first part of my image is the amplitude, as I was saying here as an example uh, over the area uh, of Bahu. Uh, which is uh, an image of ERS, a very old image, but I think it's a very nice image uh, where we can very well see um, the topographic changes. Uh, this is a topographic height differences has here over this area is an area of, of around 100 kilometer to 80 kilometer where we have here in this uh, area is a valley uh, where we have a very flat area. If you just use uh, one, uh, this amplitude, you would not really see that this is a very strong topographic area. You could probably assume this uh, on the feature, but you don't really see or identify height differences. If you look now to the face, so the second term, this face estimate that I was saying, then what you see is that we have a, a uniform distribution actually uh, of this face, which we also sometimes call it uh, as a white noise um, effect. So. Interferometry now is not only using one um, acquisition, this is what I was already saying, but in principle interferometry refers uh, to having two acquisition of the same scene. So what happens here, I have the first acquisition where I have R1, so our distance between uh, the point P and our sensor, and I have a second acquisition, which can be with the same sensor coming back after a while. So normally we have repeat pass times, uh, between 11 days or, or 20 days nowadays, um, which is uh, which is coming after a while back and then doing from the same geometry. So the same geometry means the same incidence angle range um, of a point, again, the same uh, acquisition, but having a small difference in terms of incidence angle between or, 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 or yeah, incidence angle between these two satellites. And what happens here, I get a second acquisition. So what I get is R2. So that's my second acquisition. If I just would look to this simple one single satellite acquisition. But when I do now the difference between both, uh, what I get here is in principle the delta R. So delta R means the difference between the phase difference between R1 and R2. So just going back, so from this, uh, we have one acquisition, which is image one. We have a second acquisition, which is image two from the same point with the same geometry. We have also then the same mathematical formulation. So we have this image two, uh, where we have an amplitude and a phase term, and the phase term has the same uh, expression uh, as the first image. And as I was saying, so, Assuming now that this our stochastic term here that we have here is in principle equal to each other, so it has the same uh, phase distribution, uh, then we can assume that we can neglect actually these ones. And what is uh, what is becoming now for us important is the determinist deterministic part, uh, which is from in, from the phase from image one and image two very important. And what you could do out of these two. Uh, uh, two image phases is in principle um, a complex cross-correlation between these two images. 
you do it in the complex domain because both images uh, are complex uh, values or have complex values. You multiply in principle in the complex domain image one with, with image two. This is what you do. What you get is in principle then here an amplitude part and you get this phase difference part. So delta R here, the difference between the R1 and R2. So the, the phase differences here uh, and out of these, what you can get then is an interferogram. So the interferogram is in principle nothing else as, the, uh, as an image that we have seen uh, very in the beginning where we have these uh, fringe patterns uh, visible. So going now uh, further on, so we have the image one, we have, let me say some days later on the image two, both are if nothing really happened, happened in between, no rain, no big changes in terms of man-made changes or weather changes have occurred, then these images look pretty the same in terms of amplitude. However, what is really changing is a phase difference, right? Is a phase, um, or is, is the difference between phase one and the phase two. And, and the acquisition of the second is a phase two. And what you can get out of it is this, if you do the complex uh, conjugate um, um, multiplication of these uh, two um, images, uh, then you get in principle this kind of uh, pattern that you see here. As I was saying before, if you just look to the uh, amplitude image, you would not see really a big difference in terms of um, topographic height topographic height changes. What you see here now uh, are changes uh, in the frequency of the of the fringe pattern uh, that I was uh, just reporting before. Here you see a very, very strong uh, frequency of this fringe pattern, even so strong that you see a strong decorrelation in the middle here. Here you see a very nice fringe pattern. And then you see also here fringe pattern uh, but these are in, in a different frequency, so more in a lower uh, frequency, uh, faster frequency are here because they are becoming much narrower and you have more of these uh, fringes within a certain smaller area um, of interest here. So therefore, and, and we will go now to this explanation of how these fringe patterns are built up. So as we're saying, so what we are looking now is to the difference, uh, delta R. So if you have now uh, R1 and you have R2 uh, and you have a slightly different incidence angle, as I was saying, so what happens actually that you have a slightly different um, uh, um, observation and which means a slightly different distance uh, to the point P, right? Because if you have a slightly uh, different uh, position change, uh, of a satellite, uh, then it means that the distance uh, to the point P is also changing. And this small uh, difference uh, between the distance in principle represents our, our delta R that we have between the two phases. Uh, what happens here, um, delta R, as I was saying already before, and I was mentioning it already several times, can be expressed as, as a phase. So that's in principle our phase estimates. Um, yeah, which is nothing else as, you know, it's another way as saying that we have a distance, uh, which is called delta R. So how are now these fringes built up? So what we have, we have this delta R and the delta R in principle is defined uh, by the wavelengths that we are using. And this is clearly here seen also in our phase pattern. We have uh, the wavelength that is included and the distance uh, change that we have included between two, uh, two acquisitions. So the, the wavelengths plays quite a big role in terms of the sensitivity. Uh, which kind of sensitivity do we have um, in terms of um, uh, the acquisition? So um, the lambda here is expressed, for example, let us consider to have uh, a lambda, so the wavelengths of around uh, 24 centimeters, uh, which is corresponding to an urban system, so a long wavelength system. Uh, we have the, the wavelength is expressed in terms of phases, which we are saying, and the phases, the phase is in principle varying between zero and 360 degrees, which is between zero and two pi. Um, and this is in principle later on also our sensitivity. So when the wavelength is shorter, for example, for X-band, which we have only, uh, let me say, 
uh, we would on, only have um, three centimeters uh, wavelengths, uh, then this would be much shorter and we would have a higher frequent um, uh, contribution here in terms of the fringe pattern, right? Uh, just in, in terms of uh, the sensitivity expressed in the distance uh, that we have here between the two satellites. So having now the wavelength at 24 centimeter uh, that is uh, coded into 360 degrees, uh, then the sensitivity that we have in terms of the height sensitivity lies by around uh, six millimeters. So just to understand what uh, what is what the sensitivity is bringing actually uh, to the wavelength that we use for interferometric uh, acquisition. So you see the the delta R is now uh, dependent on the wavelength that you have, and this is then also coded here in terms of how many uh, of how many fringe. Uh, fringes are, or how many fringes are included into one uh, delta R, so one distance. Um, yeah, so the, this in principle, it may, it means that the phase measurements in interferometric system can be made with a degree level of accuracy. This is what I just mentioned, uh, and it's dependent actually on the wavelengths. So we can have wavelengths ranging in KU band, for example, from one centimeter to P band, which is around 90 centimeter. Uh, and these would then correspond uh, to millimeter of accuracy as I have it just explained for the L band with 24 centimeters. Okay, how to come now to height? So we had now talked about phase differences which are expressed in terms of um, uh, range distance uh, distances that we have if you have two acquisitions. So how we can come now up uh, to the estimation of the height out of the phase. So that's a very, would say this is a very nice uh, explanation here, how we can do it. I was already mentioning it's the main uh, parameter or the main idea behind or the approach is really using the triangulation. So what we have on the one side, we have the interferometric phase. So this is our, our delta R, which we are measuring. So we are measuring the distance or the difference uh, between two phases. So from acquisition one to acquisition B, so this is what we have. So we have actually our delta R here. So having delta R as an input, this is very important. What we are doing, we are doing a kind of triangulation in order to derive from delta R using this tri triangulation uh, and the geometry uh, where also the baseline so the distances, baseline means the distances um, in, um, perpendicular uh, to each other are used in order to estimate actually then our um, um, fee estimate, which is in principle our uh, incidence angle. So the, the fee si uh, sinus, uh, um, uh, uh, sinus fee is uh, in principle our important parameter that can be used here. Having uh, the fee estimate, we can now derive actually our height. So the height is a very, very simple expression as seen here. Again, where we have as an input delta R, so our phase difference, we have um, um, our uh, uh, estimate of the incidence angle here now, and what we can get out at the end is principle our height. So what we have here are three nonlinear equations uh, and three unknown. The, one, the unknowns are the height, um, this, um, the, estimate, the estimation of the incidence angle, and the, and the phase estimate that we have here. So as, as already said before, the sensitivity that we have, so our delta R here, right, this delta R that we can um, not only estimate using just the phase difference here, uh, but this delta R can have some ambiguities also uh, in terms of depending how strong uh, the difference is and how how height in principle the height difference is in of our of our um, object. Uh, what we can have here is in principle an ambiguity of the phase estimate, which means we could have um, um, the phase can be initially measured as two pi modulo, but this means that we could have ambiguities where we could have more of this. Two, two pi's um, within one delta R. And then what we need here in order to see if, uh, if it's going into the right direction in terms of going into higher region or in negative region, so um, negative or positive values, uh, what we need to do here is also a phase unwrapping. And phase unwrapping means uh, a, right, a right phase estimation actually um, concerning um, the, uh, the estimation of the heights that we have here. Okay, so 
going back to my image explanation that we have, so we had this amplitude image, we had the, the interferometric uh, phase, so the fringe pattern that we have, and out of the fringe pattern, what you could do now is the estimation um, of, uh, of the height. So using this uh, delta R um, and looking now for the geometric uh, constellation, so from the phase to the geometry, and doing the triangulation, what you can uh, derive here out is in principle the proper heights uh, that you can see here now in this area of interest. If you just go back, so you see already this was a very steep area here. Uh, I'm just switching back and you see also that's a very steep area. Um, we have also kind a little bit kind of shadowing effects here, so which is also contributing to the signal, um, um, I would say, accuracy. Uh, which which can it make a little bit weaker, but this is in principle uh, the part uh, that you see that we have higher height differences. We see here this is a flat area now. Uh, if I go again back, you see also here we had some fringe pattern and I will explain why this fringe pattern anyway happens even though we do not have here really high topographic phases, which we are calling, I can already mention uh, it as a, as a term, we're calling this a flat earth effect that you see here. Uh, assuming that we have here near range, so the starting of the scene and we are going to far range, uh, then we see that we have on in this from near to far range uh, acquisition because we have an incidence angle change over the scene from near to far. We, we, are, also con we are also getting actually this kind of uh, fringe pattern, even though uh, this area is in flat area. This can be corrected. Um, in terms of estimated, uh, because that's a very, very regular estimate of the of the pattern. So that we call it also a dominant or deterministic uh, uh, change of the fringe pattern. Uh, and this can be estimated due to the geometry, uh, geometric uh, location, because we know uh, when, when we get the first um, point of acquisition in near range bag, and we know when we get the last uh, last signal back and we can estimate the incidence angle changes within this um, scene and like this you can then estimate or filter out the the very deterministic part of this fringe pattern that we have here uh, to which are overlapped to the topographic um, patterns that we have here. So that's that's done in principle in this in the next scene so this has been filtered out and like this a very, very flat area could be uh, considered here. Okay, so that's uh, the very, very basic out of it. Uh, you see um, this image um, here, this is now just color coded in terms of um, height changes. So this is a color coding of height changes. The next image here shows now um, the overlay of the amplitude. So you have here the color coding of the heights plus uh, the structure of the amplitude image. And like this, you see even more features uh, and looks much more plastic in terms of 3D uh, visualization uh, to, this, um, uh, to this image. You can also do a 3D view of this image like here, where you have a front view now to this uh, mountainous range that you see here in this area. And you see here also the steep uh, regions uh, that we saw before and here the flat areas or the flat area uh, also is flat uh, flat area between these mountain ranges, uh, which can which has been also identified in the fringe pattern. Okay, what are the sensitivities? So the height sensitivity, how we can estimate height sensitivity in order to see how accurate we are. We were saying that we, in principle, just uh, from the geometry, we have a very high height sensitivity uh, depending on on the wavelength that we uh, that we take. Uh, and you remember the wavelength is an important parameter and having high wave, um, I mean, having shorter wavelengths means also that the uh, accuracy is uh, in, improving. However, uh, let us consider more parameters on this height sensitivity and not only uh, the height sensitivity that is given here by the wavelengths. Um, the height sensitivity in principle uh, can be estimated again, as I was saying, um, uh, for each point using delta R. I mean, that's important. In other words, the height difference, so because delta R is our estimate uh, of the phase difference, of the geometrical difference of two acquisitions, and can be transverted or inverted into height, uh, height difference. So the height from point one to height two. So considering we have one point, um, 
which is here, so point one, and we have a second point here. Um, I'm just going back, so let me consider we have point here, and we have a delta R for this point, and uh, and then we have another point, in principle, another acquisition of uh, of the scene here, and we are looking to another pixel, uh, which is uh, where the location of this pixel point is uh, on, on another height, for example, on P2, then we can get uh, from this uh, P1 a height, and we can get from P2 a height, and what, what's coming out here is in principle the height difference um, uh, that can be caused, uh, that, that can be estimated um, also by the, by the phase, and can be then in principle um, written down as a phase difference. So the phase to height sensitivity is actually uh, defined uh, by this ratio, uh, where I have um, the delta, in principle, the delta phi, so the delta uh, phi changes uh, between the height differences, and in principle, uh, our, our height uh, changes. Delta Z here is a, is a height difference. So the one is a phase uh, difference, and this is a height difference. So we have a phase to height sensitivity can be defined actually by this ratio, which is expressed as um, a, a red variance of um, by meter, divided by meter. Okay, having now this um, estim or having now defined what is the phase to height uh, um, difference or in terms of ratio, uh, this height to um, um, phase to height sensitivity, we can call it also height to phase sensitivity because this one is depending on uh, certain parameters. It is depending on the wavelength as we have seen before, but it's also depending in principle uh, on the local incidence angle uh, and it is depending in principle on the geometry. Geometry is delta, um, delta phi here. Uh, the, if you have another expression, you can also express it here in terms of uh, baseline. This is again the perpendicular baseline here, uh, which is uh, expressed in principle in terms of a geometry, in terms of the difference or distance uh, between the two uh, satellites and is normally expressed in meters. Uh, but, uh, and you see here the range distance and again uh, the incidence angle. So there are three parameters which are important in order to define now the phase to height sensitivity. Uh, that's uh, the incidence angle, it is a wavelength, and is a baseline uh, configuration. So looking now to these uh, three parameters that we have, um, so if we like to, uh, to increase the phase to height sensitivity, so increase size to improve it, uh, then it means uh, what we should do in order to do it, or what we could do in order to do it, is to increase the spatial baseline. So increasing the spatial baseline means that we are increasing the distance between the two uh, uh, the two satellites and the two sensors uh, acquiring um, from the same geometry in the um, on, on the point P, for example. So increasing here. Um, Increasing the distance here means increasing the, uh, increasing the spatial baseline, and this would also increase the phase to height sensitivity. What happens with the system frequency? I was already saying before, so if we, in principle, um, decrease the, the wavelengths, so going from long wavelengths to shorter wavelengths, then also here we would increase, in, pr in principle, the phase to height sensitivity. Um, which which can uh, which could be very which could be very well, but it's somehow limited, uh, as we know, to uh, to KU band, which we have around one centimeter. And then what we can also change in order to increase the phase to height sensitivity is, in principle, the the local incidence angle, uh, theta. And what we can do here, what we can do, we could look more steeper, so not looking to shallow incidence angle, but looking more to steeper incidence angle. Uh, which in terms of values means to have smaller uh, values here, uh, and this would also increase the phase to height sensitivity. So considering all these parameters uh, means in principle like this, we can somehow adjust uh, with some kind of screws uh, the phase to height sensitivity for our system. I would like to introduce uh, also a term which is called height of ambiguity, which is called sometimes uh, HOA. HOA is in principle corresponding to this kappa zeta value. So here you see kappa zeta, and kappa zeta again 
is a measure of all these parameters that you see here inside. But also the height of ambiguity, if you look very carefully to it, uh, you see it's a little bit different uh, constellation, but has the same um, parameters included here. So also here, the height of ambiguity is a measure actually uh, of mainly the baseline, so the, the, the geometrical uh, configuration of the system and provides us a sensitivity, uh, also a face to height sensitivity. So this is our also our measure face to height sensitivity. Uh, that can be also expressed here in terms of kappa zeta or in terms of a ratio uh, that we have here, uh, delta phi uh, to, uh, to delta z. So that's also um, important to see that these can be used correspondent uh, with, with the same terms that we have inside. Okay, um, just now introducing a parameter in order to see the, uh, how we can estimate in principle the height error in, uh, of this uh, face to height sensitivity. So the, in principle, what we can do here in order to estimate our height, uh, height error, which is our sigma z here. This is our sigma z. Uh, we are using this face to height sensitivity. You see, this is a face to height se sensitivity um, introducing also in, introducing this parameter sigma phi uh, as a face error here into it. This in principle provides us, uh, this ratio provides us an estimate of the height uh, error that you see here. Um, and can be again also again expressed here in terms again of these uh, kappa zeta function or in terms of the parameters that we have just defined before the wavelength, the baseline, uh, and the uh, local incidence uh, geometry. So for the same interferometric phase error um, that we have here, so the phase error, the induced height error decreases with, so this is in principle our measure, it decreases when we increase the spatial baseline, this is what we said, it's increasing uh, when we increase the system frequency, uh, so a smaller, let me say smaller wavelengths, and having a steeper incidence angle. So in principle, uh, the height error that we can estimate here, the sigma z is in principle depending on these three parameters that we were just um, before mentioning. Okay, let us have an example about uh, how we can vary these parameters and then to see uh, what kind of heights uh, do we have out of it. Uh, I'm sorry, I see there's um, a mistake here in, uh, in the value, so that's uh, that's a perpendicular baseline here. Okay, let us consider again to have this ERS uh, one and two um, satellites that we have here. This is uh, these ERS satellites have been in C band. C band has a wavelength of around 5.6 centimeter um, and is corresponding in principle to a range distance of 870 kilometer. Uh, where we have uh, in principle of a mean uh, local incidence of around 23 degree. Uh, this is in principle our main measure that we have here. So the face to height sensitivity is the one that we have seen before. If we introduce now the different baselines between actually uh, the two acquisition, so then you see that the height, um, um, that the face to height sensitivity here in radians in meter is in principle increasing the baseline, the height, um, the height sensitivity is also increasing, which means we are getting a stronger height sensitivity. And what you see here in terms of how the values are changing of a height of ambiguity, we see also that the height of ambiguity is in principle decreasing, which means we have a higher sensitivity uh, in terms of values. So high values of a height of ambiguity means uh, lower uh, sensitivity, and um, going down with the value mean we have a higher sensitivity. So which means here in this term is increasing the base on the perpendicular base on the face to height sensitivity is increasing. Let us have a look to the second parameter, which is our height error, which I've introduced, which is sigma z. Um, also here we can now include sigma z. I was saying if we have sigma z, we, then we need also to consider in principle a a kind of phase error, a system phase error. Uh, this system, system phase error, let us assume this is given by the system, which is around 30, um, principally here around uh, 30 degree. 
uh, and let, let us fix it. So just now, again, increasing the baseline. Um, these values are not changing because this is our phase to height sensitivity is again increasing, which means we get a stronger height to phase sensitivity and our sigma Z value is decreasing here, the same as the height of ambiguity, uh, which means we are getting uh, smaller values and higher sensitivity, uh, smaller errors, smaller height errors, sorry. With increasing, which means again, with increasing the spatial baseline, so the perpendicular one, uh, um, we also uh, decrease actually our height error. So that's in principle the main message and you get a little bit of feeling about uh, what the values mean in terms of varying them uh, for the height sensitivity. Okay, I would like now to go again back a little bit to the geometry of, uh, sorry, interferometry so that you understand what is the role of the fringe pattern that I was just mentioning before. Now we have just looked a little bit to the geometry um, of the system in order to understand how the phase differences are built up, how we can derive from the phase uh, difference a height estimate and how how sensitive we are to this height estimate. I mean, that's that's very important because you see the geometry is a main part actually of also uh, the sensitivity of the heights uh, that we estimate. But let us consider a little bit uh, now the fringe patterns, how we can interpret fringe patterns uh, because this fringe pattern is something that we will see uh, in the uh, on the ground. So let us assume to have here a flat area and on this flat area, we have a small mountain here ongoing. This is our mountain and this is a flat area. Okay, let us consider to have now one acquisition uh, from the satellite. Uh, so we have one acquisition. What happens here, you know already, probably you know from, from a SAR, uh, how SAR is working, how it works like. Uh, we are uh, transmitting uh, a wavelength in terms of a pulse. And uh, in principle, what happens uh, is that we have over range. So that's our range. So range is from near range to far range. Again, we have over the range distance in the slant range geometry. So here we are in the slant range geometry and not on the ground range geometry because the ground range geometry would be the slant range would be projected into the ground range geometry. Now the radar, how the radar is working is just viewing it like uh, looking from, from slant range. Slant range means really having a sensor, sending it out, uh, spreading it like if you would have um, a small a light, um, light that you that that you just open up and you know that your cone of the light, depending on the distance, is spreading out and uh, getting smaller if you uh, if you decrease in principle the distance. And there's nothing else as here happens. So you send out wavelengths uh, or a signal in this case, and what you get is in principle here over the whole range distance the same height estimate. So you cannot distinguish between uh, the lower part here or the upper part because all the signals are coming back along this range line at the same time. So that's very important because we have no time difference here. So everything is coming back at the same time. So therefore, this is the main reason actually why we cannot do interferometry with one single acquisition, right? We cannot estimate height differences with one uh, acquisition because we cannot distinguish the different heights uh, along this range line because along this range line we get the same acquisition back at the same time. So that's the main, main problem and also the main reason why we need two acquisitions. Okay, having a second acquisition now here uh, from a slightly different incidence angle as I was saying, so different baselines. Uh, then what we see, so we have a second one and what happens, we have also here a transmission again uh, in slant range. We have the same part. If you just use the second acquisition, we have a long range line. Um, we cannot distinguish actually between uh, the different heights. But what happened now, if I do the difference right between both, what I happen here, actually, if I interfere, I have the one range line and the other range line, what I have is an interference between these two or these two range lines. 
And having now here a flat area, so considering not the red line, so just considering now the blue line, what happens? Because I have this interference between the first um, acquisition and the second one from the sensor point of view, what I have, you see along this flat area, I have also this interferences of the um, of the of the fringe of the of the range lines, which we call it fringe pattern. So these interferences are happening, as I was saying already before on the image. You could see it very well on a very dominant and deterministic way. So like this, this is very easily also to estimate this deterministic way because we know when we are in near range, uh, having the first signal, we know uh, the last signal actually in far range, and we can estimate the incidence angle variation within this uh, very flat terrain and can estimate actually it out so that we are at the end getting a flat terrain. So let us now consider not this blue line, but the red line, what happens here? So if I have now a, a mountain here, and I have the same configuration where I have the first and the second acquisition. What happens here now in the interferences? So I have here some interferences points over this area. So you see also those interference points are um, depending because we have a regular height, um, um, I would say height slope. Uh, we have here also a very regular uh, fringe um, interference pattern of the two acquisitions. And you see now two differences, uh, the difference between the slope that is positive to the sensor, which means directly looking to the sensor, has a different amount of uh, patterns, so interference patterns, than the slope that is negative, um, which means is is away from the sensor. So it's not looking to the sensor, but it's away from the sensor. And you see here, this interference patterns are a little bit wider spread. So everything that is uh, towards the sensor, the, the positive slope, you see you have here much more interference pattern as for this other slope, which is negative, where you have a spread out of it. So that's also a little bit stated here in this statement. To summarize it, so with respect to flat terrain, the spatial frequency of the interference pattern increases at, at, at positive slopes and decreases with negative slopes. I think that's important to understand. So if we now switch, just uh, as a representation, this is not what we do in, uh, in interferometry, uh, if you have satellite or sensors, but if we now just project it, uh, for, for better visualization and understanding uh, to the ground, let us project it to the ground, then these different interference pattern can be related to the difference in the height of this mountain, for example, right? So this is what we can just for the visualization say here. So these fear interference patterns, we have here now one, two, three, four, five of them, five patterns uh, that are describing actually or are sampling our height uh, of this mountain that I uh, that we have here. So that's in principle how we can just visualize it, right? Um, going now forward to uh, to another constellation. So this is now we have here a certain distance. This is how we had it before. But let us assume now that this distance is changed. Uh, so we have a change in the distance where we have now they are coming closer to each other, right? So here we had a spread of it, and we do remember we had quite a lot of uh, fringe patterns here uh, in terms of uh, sampling this height. If you go now closer to each other, uh, then what you see that this fringe pattern here are changing. So we do not have any more so many as before, but the amount of fringe uh, um, interference patterns or the fringes are reduced. This is a little bit, if uh, if I remember back, this was one of the parameters that we were saying, if you increase the baseline, then your sensitivity is getting higher, which means the amount of interference um, pattern that you would have to sample uh, a certain um, height, uh, height that you have on the mountain, for example, you have more samples for it. And if you have more samples to sample a certain height, uh, then it means you have a better height sensitivity. If you have less samples for the same height that you have here, it means that you have a reduced 
sensitivity to the uh, to the sampling of this uh, reduced sensitivity to the height actually and this means um, that your uh, face to height sensitivity is decreasing so this here you can really see what happens in terms of uh, fringe pattern so if you go now if you just project this again now to the to the ground as we can see it here uh, then we see that uh, in principle out of the five interference pattern that we have is now we have only three of them to sample the same height as displayed here. So this means here these interference patterns or these constellation that we have which are where we have a shorter baseline we see very very clearly uh, that the sampling of this uh, mountain uh, is uh, reduced in terms of sensitivity. Okay, yeah, that's just to see here we have again uh, the five that we have seen before and uh, this were the three. So just that you see the, the difference between both and uh, to understand in principle the concept of this uh, fringe pattern that you see later on as a color coded uh, 360 degrees um, um, face pattern actually. Okay, let us go now to an example uh, because we have now introduced um, the phase, we have introduced a phase difference and we have also introduced uh, the fringes in order to understand um, um, how does it works and how, how is the sampling and the sensitivity. Um, I have one example, which I think is a very nice example um, of, uh, of different having different frequencies. Uh, and you will see later on, uh, also depending on the wavelength, this was a little bit that we have seen before. Uh, it's also important, it's not only the, the distance, but also the wavelengths plays a role in terms of um, how, how, how high our sensitivity is actually in terms of height. So we have here the, the nice example of a Cersei uh, Ixa. This has been a shuttle mission and we had uh, at the same time, acquisition of three different wavelengths and X band, C band and L band. Uh, you see this with a temporal baseline. So there's two acquisitions within 24 hours, which is already very short. Uh, that's our amplitudes that you can see. And this is a test site over the Mount Etna in Italy. So you could already imagine that this is the Mount Etna. You see the, the crater uh, mouse here on the top uh, everywhere. Uh, and then you see the surrounding here of the mountain already just in the display very well. This can be very well seen. And then you see here a little bit this uh, urban areas uh, and here you see a little bit the mountainous area. Okay, so this is, if you just look now to the different uh, wavelengths, we see also visually already in the amplitude differences. If you just consider now uh, here, these parts, which is a very bright part, and this is a dark part here too. Uh, then you see here, this is getting a little bit um, brighter. And also this area is brighter, whereas this area here is much darker. So this can be well seen. Uh, these areas getting darker and these areas are brighter in these ones. So just to explain a little bit, also here on this surrounding, you see stronger differences between uh, these different regions, whereas in Elbant, uh, you do not really see this difference uh, so well. So it's depending, it's a little bit depending on the feature on, on this mountain. Um, we have here the mountain, we have lava in, in more here on the top, so it's bar surfaces more, and then more on the, on the wider spread areas, we have also vegetated areas uh, and forested areas there. So therefore, uh, you could also see differences here just in terms of amplitude having only the same polarization. But the, the diversity here is given by the different wavelengths. But just to remember, X-band is three centimeter wavelength, so very, very short. Uh, C-band is five centimeter around and L-band is 24 centimeter wavelengths. Okay, let us have now a look to the phases. Um, so these are the, the phases, so the interferometric phases, so two acquisition within, within this 24 hours. And what is very interesting, you see already here a very, very strong difference, right? You see a strong difference in terms of how many uh, interference patterns or fringe patterns do we have in these different uh, scenes, depending on the wavelengths. You see already, if you use X-band, you have a very, very high frequency uh, of this fringe pattern. 
and this is decreasing with the wavelength. So you see here in C-band, it's getting a little bit worse. And if you're going further on, it's even wider spread, right? So in principle, from the height to, uh, to um, the phase to height sensitivity, we can already see very well that actually uh, using uh, longer wavelength, it, it means that we are reducing uh, the phase to height sensitivity. But that's not always true, and we will discuss this, why this is not always the case and that and why also it is important to have uh, different wavelengths. For example, now looking to expand, if you just consider here, we cannot distinguish, for example, anymore the different fringes that we have here, right? And also uh, here it's getting much better and he's even better. So the problem is that the height difference in the scene for expand is already so high that we get a dick correlation. So which means we cannot distinguish anymore the different height differences. So which means then that we get something like uh, uh, like a speckle, like like a speckle or, or a strong decorrelation term here inside. So therefore, this expand is only very very well on this region. You see here, you can still distinguish very well the height differences in terms of fringes, uh, which is not really very well possible over this area. However, I was saying before, we have here an effect where we have still two things on top. So one thing is that we have, you remember, the, the fringe pattern that is given by the satellite geometry, which is our flat Earth uh, frequency of the fringe pattern. And we have on top, uh, we have the real topographic uh, uh, fringe, or let me say the interference pattern that we have. So we have both combined. Uh, as I was saying, we can do this, that we can remove the flat earth in order to estimate this. This is what is done. And then in the next scene, you see now that this uh, dominant frequency has been estimated and extracted. And like this, what you see here now is a interferometric pattern that is only given by the topographic changes that we have. So it's only by the height changes, not by the system, um, geometry, but by the height changes of the of the surface topography. And here you see again the same as we have seen before. It was just better visual. Therefore, I was already mentioning there the differences in X, C, and L. But you see now here the same uh, the same thing as as before. You have now because out of the overlay of these two components. Uh, you could not see this area very well, right? It was a very decorrelated area because we could not distinguish the, the, the interference pattern. But now because this overlay uh, of this flat earth has been removed, uh, it is much better visible that we have here a quite different um, uh, interference pattern as we would have it here on the on a, on a real mountain area as we could see it before in our in our scene in the amplitude scene. So now here in this in this area where we see uh, the, um, the the mountain area in this case the the volcano. So this is the volcano area here, if you remember. And we were saying, uh, you see it also here. We have here very high frequency of the of the interference patterns, and then this is getting lower in terms of frequency um, over the over site area. Here we saw already from the image um, features that this could be a very strong topographic area and is also seen in the interferometric phase. We have strong decorrelation in terms of uh, expand. If you go now to C band, um, this decorrelation also here in this region where we have steep areas, uh, it seems that we have steep areas because the fringe pattern are very, very close to each other. So this is an indication to have a very steep area and is probably too steep for this wavelengths and the sensitivity here. So here much better, we can estimate it with C-band where we can distinguish very well the different heights in terms of the steepness of, of, the, uh, of the underlying um, surface. And also here over the, uh, on the volcano, it's very well distinguishable, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and also here we see we have a better estimate of the, um, of the interference pattern. Uh, we see also here the interference pattern well, but they look much more disturbed, right? They are not so clean, let me say, and better distinguishable uh, than, for example, for C band. So this, and also here of this, of this very mountainous area here, we see that we can still distinguish the fringe pattern very well. If we go now to Alband, uh, to the to the lowest uh, wave, uh, to the 
to the longest wavelength. We see here very well, we can distinguish very well the fringe pattern. We see that for the same height difference that we have over this area, we have less uh, fringe, uh, less interference pattern visible as for example, this one. In this case, as for seabed, in this case, we can really say, okay, everything that is made in L-band um, is probably not so, so great over this area because here we would much uh, better have a better height uh, face to height sensitivity because uh, we have uh, much more uh, sample points in order to sample the height here in this C band image. However, you could see that there is some decorrelation ongoing over this area in X band. It's not only that the height here is too steep for this wavelength, but you see also we get some decorrelation inside, uh, which is mainly probably done. Um, by other effects as for example uh, vegetation and therefore also here so expand has a principle on and theoretically because of the shortest wavelength it has the highest uh, face to height sensitivity but it's very very much depending on the underlying structure of the uh, of the height that you like to estimate so the the steepness of the height and it's also depending uh, a little bit on the surface if you have on top uh, strongly vegetated areas then you will see you have here in terms of the phase estimate uh, you have a very um, not not very well distinguishable area where you can really have the phases uh, done so probably just to say um, baseline was one you could adjust right you can adjust these fringe pattern not only with frequency remember we can also do it by baseline so you could adjust this scene uh, in increasing the baseline then or decreasing the baseline so that you get the proper height sensitivity also over this area so then you would have probably also a better distinguishable region of interest so that's also possible right so just remember this is just now a fixed baseline for all uh, for all the configuration here, uh, one baseline, but for sure it can be adjusted also using different baselines. Okay, airband can be very well, very good also when you have very strongly vegetated areas because airband is a very long wavelength and can penetrate into the uh, into into the vegetation and is getting more ground contribution. And like this, you could also better than. Uh, have a more pure uh, or then, let me say distinguished uh, phase estimate uh, with a smaller variance and you could have a better estimate than also of the phase. And this means with the height uh, of the height. Okay, that's a little bit to explain still the differences between baseline and, um, and frequency. Uh, concerning uh, concerning there was a third parameter this was the incidence angle we were already saying when you look very steep depending again on the on the region of interest if you have very steep area in terms of steep mountains or if you have flat uh, more uh, more hilly areas not really steep terrain uh, then you can adjust uh, the incidence angle in order to get also best better estimate okay i would switch now over to um to a next parameter that I would like to introduce uh, because there's always two parameters available um, like we have the amplitude and uh, of a signal of an image we have normally the amplitude and we have also the face so what we have now considered in the moment is uh, this complex uh, uh, multiplic multiplication of the complex um, two images of this complex conjugate of the phases, so this was the main interest in the moment. But what you could also do, you can get also in uh, this amplitude factor out of it, which can provide you also an estimate of the amplitude itself. So which means what you could do between these images is not only a multiplication in the complex domain in order to get the phase differences, but what you could also do is uh, derive an interferometric coherence which is done actually by a normalized complex correlation coefficient. So what you can do here, you can derive a normalized complex coefficient, uh, which we are calling gamma. And with gamma, it's nothing else as in principle, um, a correlation between the first image and the second image that you have here and to normalize it. So that's a correlation coefficient that you have here in the complex domain. Uh, what you see here already, what is needed in order to 
uh, correlate the first image with the second image is what you need is an estimation window. So that's important uh, to remember. So by this cor correlation, you need an estimation window, which means if I have a scene, I cannot do it only with, with one uh, single a correlation pixel by pixel, because then I would not, I, then in principle, my gamma uh, would, would not give a, a accurate estimate. But what happens here now is you, what you like is to correlate a certain area, region of interest in terms of window size here, the estimation window in order to have a correlation uh, that is feasible. So what is needed here is in principle the estimation window. Uh, what you need here is uh, to estimate uh, the minimum. What you could do normally is a three by three estimation window, and then you can go up higher and higher, five by five, eleven by nine by nine, eleven by eleven, for example, and so on. So, like these, uh, these are the uh, the um, uh, this this kind of clamor here. What you see, uh, which in principle provides you. Uh, the the view of that you have in principle an estimation that you need an estimation window in order to form this interferometric coherence. Let us have a little bit a look what this estimation window makes uh, to us, right? In terms of uh, standard deviation. So the standard deviation of the what you can do is we can look for the standard deviation of the interferometric phase. This is here expressed. So this is our sigma. Uh, the sigma phase uh, that we have here. And again, it depends on the underlying coherence. So our phase estimates So this, therefore it's important to know what, uh, how the interferometric coherence looks like because the phase is depending actually on this interferometric coherence uh, and also the number of looks, which mean the, uh, uh, the, the estimation window that we are estimating. As seen before, so we can start with um, three by three window size and can increase it. It's a little bit depending, and this is providing us also the, uh, the number of look. Just like to go back. Okay, so this depending, this gives us the, the number of looks. The number of looks provide us in principle the estimate how, how big is our estimation window. So here on this plot, you see the number of looks. So we start with one, which is in principle um, very low uh, estimation window, and then it's going and increasing with the number of looks and getting higher and higher. So what you see here now is on the on the lower axis, this is interferometric coherence. So interferometric coherence is this uh, complex cross correlation of the two images. And this one is ranging between zero and one. So what does it mean? Zero means I have a strong decorrelation, which means both images are very different from each other. Uh, and therefore it means I have a low interferometric coherence. If the image pairs are very similar to each other, right, then it means in principle I have a very high coherence and can be close to one. So that's a very high coherent estimate. On this axis, you see I have this interferometric phase error. So that's our phase error that I have here. And let us consider to have a small phase error and to have a high interferometric coherence and to have also a low number of look, then you will see we are somehow um, uh, in this area here, actually. If I increase now the phase errors a little bit uh, more and more, um, and then you see already, even if I would have the number of look, a very small estimation window here, a small estimation window, uh, you see this is slowly and slowly decreasing in terms of interferometric coherence. So you see if you're here now uh, with 60, then I have an interferometric coherence here uh, about 0 0.8 already. Uh, if I increase even more, so a high phase error of 90, I would have already interferometric coherence about 0.3. Okay, this you see if I increase estimation window, um, what happens actually, uh, is that uh, I, in principle, uh, what happens here that I, uh, um, and I have an increase in principle of the interferometric phase, uh, you see that is I have a decrease, actually very, very fast decrease of the interferometric coherence. So this is happening that interferometric coherence is actually decreasing uh, with the amount of, um, a, a amount of a window side that, that you have, so the number of looks in this case. 
coming back, so here you see really a strong correlation between the interferometric phase and the interferometric uh, coherence. So if I have a high uh, phase error, right, then the interferometric coherence is very low. So that's also very important to know. So my interferometric coherence is low, so my phase, um, so my phase is getting low too, right? So my phase estimate in principle, the error is in this case uh, increasing. So that's, uh, I have a higher standard deviation, which means I have a um, higher increase, or which means a higher error estimate in this case. So therefore this correlation, this is a little bit what is written here down, uh, it's very strongly dependent on what kind of estimation window you use and which kind of interferometric coherence do you have. So the interferometric coherence is always a check of how good is your phase estimate. If the interferometric coherence is already very low over a scene, then you know that your standard deviation uh, of the phase is, in, is very high. And what does it mean? It means that, that your height estimate will be very low. So your height estimate is uh, then very poor. And, and this again means um, you have a strong dependence or could be, a, uh, this interferometric coherence could be a good check in terms of how good is your height estimate. Okay, let us go to this uh, box here that you see here. Uh, what I have here is an, an increase in decorrelation. So loss in coherence is associated with an increase in the phase variance. So this is what I was just trying to explain with this plot. Uh, that you see here. The increased phase variance lead to increased height error. So that's very important to understand that this interferometric coherence parameter is very strong correlated in, actually with the interferometric phase error. Okay, what you have here again, it's, um, it's just, um, uh, it's a distribution function, which is in principle a, a function here uh, of, um, of the phase error and also the number of looks that you see here. Um, and what you see here, um, just as a spread, sorry, it's not very well visible because this legend is very small. Uh, what you see on this legend is a red one, uh, is the number of look uh, the same, which is um, corresponding to this one, which is a big one, is one, and then going until eight, which is a blue one. Yeah. Um, so what you see here is um, gamma zero, um, zero 007. And uh, this is, a, let, let us consider, this is, this is a interferometric coherence of 0, 07. So this would be something that is here related in this area. Okay. And um, if you look now to the number of look, if you have a small number of look, then you see the spread. So the distribution here, the PDF function uh, is wider spread. Uh, if you have now a higher amount of number of looks here, for example, uh, eight, uh, then you see that this is going lower and lower. So in principle, you, the spread of both uh, is uh, getting smaller here. So the distribution is in principle smaller. So like this, you could, um, you have in principle a better peak, let me say, in terms of distribution um, over this area of interest. Okay, just to consider also that um, this PDF function is also important in order to consider uh, also the, the accuracy actually of, um, uh, of interferometric coherence. Okay, I have an example to again display a little bit what is the relation between phase and coherence values that you see here. Let us con consider a simulation that I, I have here in this image. The simulation is here. I have an absolute phase, uh, which is uh, in this case quite high. Um, this is in principle, uh, this is our unwrapped phase that we have uh, here already. This is our just uh, the interferometric phase of a, um, uh, of a sphere that you see here, right? Let us consider now the sphere with the interferometric fringe pattern that we have here. So this is already the height and this is in principle still with the fringe pattern. So the coherence here is very high. We have coherence values of one uh, with one look um, um, estimation window. And you see that we can distinguish very, very well the, 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 the differences between each fringe. So you can really see the very, very well fringe pattern of in principle the sphere. If you now decrease uh, the coherence already here by a value 
uh, of 0.8, and then you see you get a more stronger variance of the phase. So what you see is a phase, right? And uh, you see a stronger variance of the phase. And this is happening with decreasing the coherence more and more, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, and even to 0.2. What happens actually if you, as we're seeing before, so the coherence is decreasing, and with this, the variance of the, the standard deviation, so the variance of the phase is increasing. And with this, the estimation of a pure uh, phase estimate is not uh, very well possible anymore. So, because you get a very, very strong error also in your height estimate like this. Let us have a look into a real image of an interferometric phase image. Um, that's again the absolute phase. And here we have uh, the fringe pattern again over a real scene where we have your topographic uh, variations. Again, the coherence over the scene is high here. Uh, which means we can distinguish very well these differences. Uh, whereas, if you look now uh, in reducing the interferometric coherence here to 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 4, and 2 again here, you cannot really distinguish very well uh, the different fringe patterns. And like this, the, you will have a problem in the in the height estimation later on. Okay, that's just to explain also the correlation between the interferometric parameter, interferometric coherence parameter and the interferometric phase. So that's a, that's a very uh, important relation between two um, of these main parameters that you can get out of the, uh, of the interferometric configuration. Okay, so let us go now a little bit to these um, differences between repeat pass and single pass and what, what kind of issues do we have here? So for repeat pass, I was already mentioning this a little bit before, repeat pass means actually that we have an, uh, here um, a system where we, where we have one acquisition and after some days, a second acquisition. And what can happen between this acquisition, I was saying before is we have an assumption in most of the cases that uh, the weather condition is the same, so to have really low impact on the interferometric phases. But for sure, what can happen between this re, uh, these two acquisition in repeat pass, it can happen that we have, in principle, some um, temporal effect, we call it. So something that is changing temporally between the two acquisitions. For example, we could have cloud effects, we could have rain effects, we could also have man-made um, uh, changes uh, in, on our, in our scene. So this can happen. So what can, what, how we are considering now this uh, temporal uh, effect that we have here. So again, we are starting with these two images, um, um, having these two images acquisition in, in the first case. So what we have here, we have again, these two phase terms. We have the deterministic phase term where we're estimating the absolute phase difference. And we have the stochastic term, which is phi s that you see here. And in terms of repeat per system, uh, where we have a time in between, we have this kind of phi uh, propagation term two, where we have time one and time two. What happens um, actually here on these two terms that we have is for sure that uh, if in principle, uh, what can happen that both of, of these phase terms are unequal because something in between was changing. So uh, the location of the scatter in the resolution cell and or the properties may change in the time between the two acquisitions. Um, from, this from this point of view, uh, there could be a change between these two phase contribution and we are calling this a temporal decorrelation. So it can be a decorrelation, so a phase decorrelation due to a change then a that can appear, as we're saying, either man-made or due to any kind of natural um, differences. So the phase induced by the propagation medium, so for example, the atmosphere or the ionosphere varies in time between the two acquisitions. Um, this can also, this can man-made happen, or this can also happen, as I was saying, uh, depending on the uh, atmospheric or ionospheric uh, effects. And what happens here um, to having now again this uh, uh, fee propagation that we have here, uh, T1 and T2, so a change between these two acquisition, it can mean that we have a reduced um, in principle quality um, in order to, to measure displacement or any kind of height measurements. 
So let us again go to this image back and XC and uh, XC and Alband and have a look um, because this is, an, is a typical case where we have here 24 hours temporal distance, which means temporal uh, changes between uh, both of them. So something could happen between these two uh, cases, which but must not have, right? So that's always um, a little bit uh, tricky because what is very good in order to uh, to see what is the condition of the weather and, and how is the condition actually on the ground. But um, in most of the cases, especially specifically if it's 24 hours apart, we assume that uh, the less uh, of changes has have happened actually. Okay, but let us have a look on on the coherence now um, of these 24 hours. So we we are building now this complex uh, correlation um, of these two images um, here in in this uh, in X band, C band, and L band, as you can see, and we see that we have some that the coherence is not always very high. Do you remember high coherences are displayed here with a white color and low coherences are displayed with a black color. So everything that is in between uh, means uh, it is, um, it's ranging uh, with the values in between. So in x for example, we can see that um, within this 24 hours, we have some areas which have a very high coherence. But we have also some areas here, the black areas, for example, which have a very dark or very low coherence. The same is actually in C band, we have high coherence area and then very dark coherence area. If you go now to L band, we see we have very high coherence area of most of the places. We have smaller areas which are dark, but most of the cases you see here, uh, we have a high coherence. Okay, what does it mean? It, in principle, if you just consider now the coherence estimate, then it means that with L band over this area, we get a much better um, estimate of the height because the variance of the interferometric phase is lower in, in L band. And like this, we get a very good estimate using L band. And if you look now here back to X band, it's very grayish, even the, the white area are not completely white. They are a little bit grayish already, so not really white. And it would mean that over this area in X band, uh, we would get a very, um, a very high phase variance. And this again would mean that we get uh, a very low quality of the height estimates. So if you remember now back, in terms of sensitivity uh, on the wavelengths and the and the interference patterns, then this is actually exactly opposite, right? We were saying uh, X band would be great to have uh, for the sensitivity, uh, where L band is not so good in sensitivity. But now you see in natural environments that L band has a very high coherence, and with this we have a better performance in terms of height estimate as using, for example, X-band, where we have a very strong decorrelation over natural terrain. This decorrelation can happen uh, manifold, right? So it can happen because of changes here in this area where we have, for example, vegetation. This is something that we saw already a little bit in the face here in this area. And, and it looks, because it's very grayish in the in, in the coherence image, we see that the that the phase variance was also much stronger. So this means here the proper estimate of the phase is, is not very uh, well. And you see with uh, C band, this is a little bit improving, but it's much, much better, better for L band because L band uh, is penetrating deeper or uh, stronger, let me say stronger uh, through vegetated uh, regions uh, so that you get more ground contribution and like this you get a much higher coherence because normally the ground is not changing so much except if you would have really rain events and the soil moisture is changing and then also the coherence would be lower. That's true, but, uh, but the sensitivity uh, on the changes that happen between a short time is much uh, is, is much lower and therefore more robust, let me say like this, if you have repeat pass systems, and I would, uh, um, then it would be much better to have uh, a high coherence. So you see in principle, there's no black and white, 
this is everything is a trade off and you need to consider all these different parameters in order to get the best constellation for best estimate. Um, again, depending on on the area of interest that you have. I would like just to go forward to explain also other kind of temporal uh, decorrelation that could happen. Uh, due to wind. Um, wind is one temporal decorrelation that is happening sometimes. And you see here in Elband, that's an intensity image. And Elband is a very small part. This is from a uh, from an airborne campaign in England over a forested area. That's a forested area that you see here in white. And the surrounding is really pure ground, very, very short grassland. If you now look uh, to the different coherences, so that's a coherence. You see uh, the white area, the high coherence area is the surrounding because we only see ground, no vegetation uh, effect. And you see that's a temporal baseline. So only 20 minutes um, difference between two acquisitions. You see already uh, that the volume part here in the middle, so the forest has a lower, uh, lower coherence. This has two effects. The first effect is it it is it has a strong vegetated area. This means you only partly see the ground, and therefore you have also some decorrelation. But what is also interesting that we have that the the for the the wind speed has been calculated uh, during this uh, acquisition times, and we could see that we have different wind speeds available. <coughs> Sorry. Here you see lower coherences over um, uh, higher coherences, sorry, over some part in the forest. So it's not everywhere the same because of the different wind conditions. And if you look now to a smaller wind condition like here, uh, then you see already also that you have a higher coherence. So strong wind condition can really over forested area could really uh, be a very, very strong cause of strong decorrelation where you have uh, strong vegetated areas. And lower wind speed, as here, for example, could mean that you have um, much higher uh, correlation um, uh, or interferometric coherences available. However, I would like to show you more, just to irritate you even a little bit more on it. So we were not only doing this two acquisition, but we had also more acquisition in terms of uh, time and wind speed. And you see here we have everywhere we have different patterns in terms of interferometric coherences. You, you, now you see here uh, four points. One point is, uh, is a high coherence point, which is a ground point, and three vegetation points in the forest. Let me go here now. You have here the temporal baseline. So the temporal difference between two acquisition and you have here the coherence. The coherence for the surface point, independent on when uh, the, uh, the, the temporal baseline, also in, independent on when this measurement has been taken, are always high. If you go now to the three volume points that you see here, it's actually quite interesting because here in this volume point, after a very short repeat time, uh, you see you have everything is possible from very low, uh, for, in principle, from, from very low coherence until a bit higher coherences. And if you go even um, have a longer uh, temporal distance, then you see you have quite lower coherences. This is another volume point. You, you could have high and low coherences, again, a wider spread. And after a while, again, lower coherences. Then another point could be that you uh, coherence is again increasing over a certain point, like here, for example, seen, and you have in the beginning a lower coherence region. This provides you just a, a view that it is not so easy to say low wind means um, higher coherences and high wind means uh, lower coherence. It, it, it tells you a little bit that the, the whole process is much more complex. And that wind it is a cause of uh, of a coherence decay, uh, but it doesn't really say to you um, how to avoid it, right? Um, it it must not mean that if you have short acquisition times between the different um, between the different images, if you have short acquisition time, that you would always have high coherences and that you have a slow decay. Uh, with the temporal increasing the temporal baseline. This doesn't must mean like this. And this is also what you see here in the different uh, points. So that's the effect of repeat pass uh, interferometry. 
I just like now to show you what happens if you have single pass interferometry. This is also possible single pass interferometry. You see it here. Um, I would like to show an example of the Tandem X mission, uh, which is uh, w one of the German, uh, which, which is the German mission, which have uh, single pass interferometry capabilities, where we have two satellites flying in the formation and illuminating the same spot uh, on the ground. Uh, this is a dual use mission. Uh, with DLR and uh, Airbus uh, defense uh, space. It has been launched in 2010, so already a while ago, uh, and uh, it's still operating quite well, and we hope also that it's operating for the first uh, longer periods too. I hope my animation is working in this WebEx formation, WebEx, uh, but I do not really see that this works now. What I can do, just probably, I will go out, ah, here, sorry. Yeah. Okay, it should now work. So just that you know, what is this, our single pass interferometry. So we have the first satellite, which is a Terrasar X, uh, X satellite in space. And then later on, two years uh, later, the Tandem X were launched. And what happens, so the Terrasar X is in a certain orbit and keeps the orbit. And we have uh, positioned the Tandem X, so the second satellite, um, like this, that it, it is surrounding actually the Terrasar X satellite. And you see with the surrounding of the Terrasar X satellite, we get different distances actually to the set satellite. So we have, uh, we can, uh, we can, this ellipse that is built up, we can change in terms of having 300, 400, 200, 100 meter distance. And we have also, we call it another baseline, which we call this um, a long track baseline. Okay, this is uh, how we have it. Um, this constellation is called a helix constellation because the one satellite uh, for a certain time and space is uh, captured in an ellipse. But if you look now in time uh, flying in this orbit, then this the position of the satellite is changing. Uh, it's sometimes forward of the Terrasar X and sometimes backward of the Terrasar X. And like these, uh, if you would consider this, uh, how they are rotating uh, on each other, then it is uh, configured like a helix um, um, configuration. So helix means like, like, for example, our DNA has also a helix configuration, and this is um, also here considered as this helix configuration, where you can, in principle, derive like this. You can avoid collision. That's the most important part, and you can derive a flexible uh, baseline uh, constellation. So that's the main idea behind it. Okay, so the main uh, idea about this single pass uh, interferometric mission is uh, to have derived a global digital elevation model that you can see here, uh, where we have uh, absolute height accuracy over flat areas of around around one meter with a uh, posting of 12 by 12 meter. I mean, that's very important. And since 2016, uh, these data uh, can be um, can be uh, can be used for scientific purposes. Uh, for this, we have in principle kind of data tables. So for this tandem X 12 meter uh, spatial resolution, um, we have an horizontal, as we're saying already, horizontal accuracy that you we have here. This was a nominal accuracy the vertical accuracy that we were defining before the mission in order to keep the accuracies. And you have seen we have even better accuracies as uh, in the beginning um, just defined. We have also 30 meter uh, dams available that can be um, used and also the 90 meter. So the 90 meter dams uh, can be downloaded immediately and the, in principle the um, the um, the nine, uh, the 12 meter dams need to be purchased uh, by um, by a proposal, a scientific proposal that is submitted uh, to the science server, and then other people can um, request data from any kind, uh, any part of the world. Okay, I think I would now stop here <laughs> the presentation. Um, or, or did I, I know I still have five minutes, sorry. Okay, no, then I, I just continue. I thought it's already a break time, but I see now on my on my notice that we have still five minutes. Okay, then I will go forward. So that's that's a uh, possibility here, right? To um, to have these, um, uh, to have the data request. So let us go forward due to this very particular configuration between these two satellites that we are flying information. 
uh, we have different imaging modes that are available. So the one we called or data acquisition mode, we, the one we called pursuit monostatic mode, which means uh, that both satellites can actively send and actively receive uh, the signal. So this means both satellites can be working independently, but they are somehow working uh, still in a close by situation. So the differences between the images here would be something like uh, uh, can be uh, 20 seconds or something like this. So this is when we would have really long baselines between them. So this one we call pursuit monostatic. Then for the real single pass interferometric uh, mode, we have this bi-static mode. The bi-static mode is actually that having uh, one satellite uh, transmitting and the other um, or both uh, receiving. So, but we have only one transmission and in principle, the other one is receiving, or you could also say that the, that the same one is receiving. So the bi-static would be really originally one transmitting and the other one um, um, receiving. Uh, this is, has been done that both re uh, receive it just in case that the second one uh, would have a failure so that you would have still the acquisition in a monostatic mode. So therefore this has been done um, just to be secure on this. Then there's another opportunity too, which we call it alternating by static. The alternating by static means that the one is transmitting and the other is receiving and then changing it, alternating it, then the other one is transmitting and then the other one is receiving, both are again receiving and, and so on. So that means in principle, um, the other, the alternating bi-static. So the real single pass acquisition is actually the bi-static one because I mean, here are seconds in between and here's no seconds in between. So this is therefore we call, I call it real bi-static bi single pass interferometer uh, because here you have really no effects in terms of temporal decorrelation. And this is also have been the main mode in order to acquire or to derive uh, this uh, global digital innovation model. Okay, let us uh, have just a little bit a look on the three modes and the data that we acquire on it. Uh, here you see now uh, in this pursuit monostatic mode, uh, one image which is taken uh, over a uh, test site, a peatland test site, Marvas in Borneo, uh, where you see here, so that's a stripe, this is an error of the images, but please do not consider this because the focus is here really uh, on one of these uh, wider areas. This has been done in one of the earliest, let me say, um, acquisitions uh, that we have with, with the Tandem X mission. Um, one of the first images that we have explored. And here, this is a really tropical peatland forest. And here you see we have already some man-made channels uh, which are trying now to um, to get um, to 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 get the water that is here in the peatland inside to uh, to get it drier and to channel a little bit the water resources. I'd just like to continue uh, for two minutes and then I will do a little break. So I have here another two images, which uh, just looking to the um, amplitude images and the uh, one polarization a little bit differing baselines, but quite closely. You see here a small dark area, but otherwise they look quite the same. I have now the interferometric coherence here. So it's a very high coherence because I have no temporal decorrelation. And it seems that the volume decorrelation also here due to the, the volume itself is uh, very negligible. If you now look to the second equation where we had this small pattern uh, in the scene, in the amplitude image, this is now the coherence image. We see very well there's a very strong decorrelation ongoing. And we see here also some patterns in it. That's very nicely here to see. And the same is actually here is also a pattern seen in, in the last image where again here is a very good coherence. So what happens, I was already saying, we have some seconds in between these two acquisition and a monostatic case. And this is a tropical area region. So what happens here is really that on this day, there was probably a storm going over this area. And you see very well the wind effect because you have here this uh, patterns, which seem that like waving patterns. Uh, it seems that there's a vegetation on it where you have put up these waves and you see it also here. So this is kind of a temporal effects that we have due to 
uh, let me say, bad weather or uh, tropical weather effects. And you see here, this was also very interesting. There's a front coming in, still didn't reach everything, uh, only the first part, but it's very clear that here we have a very strong uh, pattern in terms of a temporal decoration ongoing in the scene. So just uh, to see also, even if you have some seconds in between, uh, we could have uh, potential effects, uh, temporal effects that are here seen. Okay, but then I would do now the break because now we have the break and we do it uh, for half an hour, if I remember well. So thanks a lot. And I can be still available now uh, when we close the recording for this break time and can be available for, for questions in the chat, if you like. Thank you. <laughs>